Because you know who was in that house that night. You, you do, Jen. The Pan family was simply picture perfect, a Vietnamese immigrant couple working hard to provide the best for their daughter, Jennifer, who was a straight-A student with a bright future. Or so everyone thought until she and her dealing boyfriend carefully planned the murder of her parents and succeeded in killing her mother. And they literally would have gotten away with murder if it wasn't for Jennifer herself. So, what caused the two to get caught? Double life. The Pan parents, and especially the father Han, were strict to say the least. Bic and Han Pan were Vietnamese citizens who fled to Canada as political refugees. They met, fell in love, and got married in Toronto and had two children, Jennifer and Felix. The couple got jobs at a car manufacturer in Ontario, and by working hard, their main goal was to provide their children the opportunities they never had. Their oldest daughter, Jennifer, was born on June 17, 1986, and ever since she was a child, her parents expected absolute perfection from her. She was enrolled in piano and figure skating lessons very early, but she unfortunately ended up tearing a ligament in her knee, and any hopes of her being a professional skater were dashed. However, with all these activities and long-time aspirations, it was impossible for her to have a stable social life. Jennifer herself felt like she was imprisoned in her own home. Jennifer was extremely stressed and used the criticism to work even harder. The pressure built up to the point she started self-harming in eighth grade, but the real rock bottom for her was when she failed to be named valedictorian and received no medal for her academic achievements. By the end of grade nine, Jennifer was not the best student, so with the help of old report cards, scissors, glue, and a photocopier, she resorted to doctoring her report cards to make it look like she had all A's. This was definitely not a one-time thing as she weaved her web of deceit for years without getting caught. She got accepted to Ryerson University, but they withdrew its offer when she failed calculus in her senior year and wasn't even able to graduate. Jennifer was more than desperate for her parents not to find out what she had been up to, so she lied that she'd been starting attending classes at Ryerson in the fall. Jennifer went to insane lengths to make her parents believe her stories and blame the fact that she was a pathological liar on her strict upbringing. She also didn't see the lies as something wrong, but as a chance for her to do better. Jennifer claimed to have gotten a $3,000 scholarship and went as far as to pack up her backpack every morning and get into the bus as if she was heading to class. Instead, she spent her time in the library watching videos related to pharmacology in order to create notebooks full of class notes that she could show her parents that she was working hard towards her degree. Jennifer was able to keep up the charade perfectly for two years. Her parents were proud of her, and she even lied to her friends in case they ever ended up meeting her parents. And then it all came crashing down. The Downfall Jennifer met her boyfriend Daniel Wong in grade 11. They were good friends, but their relationship changed from platonic to romantic during a band trip to Europe in 2003. The two started dating that very summer. Daniel was far from the guy that parents who are more traditional, especially the Pans, so you might understand why Jennifer wasn't exactly ecstatic to tell her parents about their relationship. She did find a way to move in with him, though. When she successfully pretended to be a student at Ryerson for two years, she also pretended to transfer to the pharmacology program at the University of Toronto as per her parents' wishes but she suggested that she move in for three nights a week with her friend Topaz due to the long commutes, knowing that the fake achievements would help manipulate her parents to do whatever she wanted to improve her academic life. However, Jennifer never moved in with her friend. Instead, she stayed with Daniel and his parents. When the time came for Jennifer to graduate, she and Daniel paid someone to create a fake transcript with grades to her parents' liking. But as expected, her lies started catching up to her. During the time she was pretending to study at the University of Toronto, she had told her parents that she had started working as a volunteer at Sick Kids. This is when her father started suspecting that something wasn't right, as he noticed that she didn't have a uniform or a key card. 
So, Han decided to tail after her at work and found out the truth eventually. He wanted to kick her out, but decided against it by giving Jennifer an ultimatum. If she wanted to keep living under their roof, she would have to follow their rules. Their most important demand was that she cut off all contact with Daniel. And if Jennifer thought she was imprisoned in her home before this, it would be nothing compared to the new measures Han took to punish his daughter. They took away her cell phone and laptop, and she was forced to quit all of her jobs except the piano tutoring. Even with all this, she still found a way to communicate with Daniel and even snuck out a few times to see him. We have learned by now that she doesn't do well with following orders. Eventually, Daniel got tired of the whole thing and broke things off and started seeing another woman named Christine. This didn't sit well with Jennifer, who suddenly felt like she lost control. The only reason she had to defy her parents was now gone, so she had to take him back. To do this, she made up an extremely out-of-pocket story so she could have Daniel feel sorry for her and turn him against his current girlfriend. She told Daniel that a man posing as a police officer had knocked on her door, and as soon as she had opened it, a group of men came in and ganged her. She claimed that Christine was the one who had ordered them to do so, and had even sent her a bullet in the mail as a warning to stay away from Daniel. And just when you think that there's no chance that this can get any worse, it definitely does. Star-Crossed Killers Jennifer's plan to kill her parents and get the inheritance was just as detailed as all the lies she had made up until now. The idea came to her when she got back in touch with an elementary school friend named Andrew Montemayor in spring of 2010. He confessed that he had thought about killing his own father once, and Jennifer was intrigued, to say the least. Her first attempt to hire someone to kill her father didn't go smoothly, but that just inspired Jennifer and Daniel, who she had reconciled with, to come up with another plan that they were sure would work. They'd hire someone to kill Jennifer's parents, collect her inheritance of $500,000, and live happily ever after. The idea behind this murder would be that she paid the hitman $10,000, and she would pay this from the inheritance that she would receive if the plan was successful. Daniel gave her the contact details of a man called Homeboy who would want to do the job. Homeboy, whose real name is Lenford Crawford, contacted another man himself called Eric Sean Cardi. In turn, Eric contacted David Milviganam and the plan was set in motion. The murder took place on November 8, 2010 at Pan's house in Markham. It was supposed to look like a robbery gone wrong, where the parents were killed in the process and Jennifer was left unharmed. As part of the plan, Jennifer unlocked the front door of the family home before she went to bed, then spoke by phone to Milvaganam. Shortly afterwards, Milvaganam and two other people entered the home through the unlocked front door, all carrying guns. The hitmen took Bick and Han to the basement. Jennifer was tied to the banister with a shoelace so they could sell the intrusion story, but she put her phone in her leggings in order to contact the authorities without struggling to reach it. Not everything went to plan, though. Bick was killed instantly by three shots to the head, but Han would miraculously survive his wounds. The three men then took all the cash that was in the house, including $2,000 from Jennifer, and fled the scene. Jennifer ends up calling the police. She sounds distraught while talking to the phone operator, and she can barely say her address. I'm so broken, I heard shots like pops. I don't know what's happening, I'm tied upstairs. Jennifer is weeping on the phone and talking so fast, the phone operator can barely pick up what she's saying. She sounds panicked about the apparent home invasion and the fact that she can't find her parents. The phone operator tries to calm her down and get her information, but Jennifer acts hysterically on the phone. She adds, oh, what's happening? I'm tied upstairs. But this is where things get suspicious, though the operator could barely notice due to the fact that she's trying to calm her down. How is she calling if she is restrained? If she has freed herself and made the call, why is she saying she is still tied? Plus, the way she says it sounds different than the rest of the call. It sounds almost cold. Some people broke into her house. Okay, okay, you're showing all his money? Like, ma'am, 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 ma'am,
She says, implying that she's still tied up and also making a call. And says that she hears pops from downstairs. Then her father can be heard screaming for help, and Jennifer keeps being convincing on her whole act as the victim in this situation. Even though she didn't expect her father to come out alive, she has enough presence to keep playing the victim to the dispatcher, and quite convincingly so. She also starts assuring her father that she's talking to the police as a way to let him know there's no need for himself to call and give his take on the home invasion, because if he's able to call to the police, he'd say his side of the story, and it would contradict hers. It wouldn't be good for her made-up story if her father claims he saw her friendly talking to the robbers and walking around the house freely. Her dad manages to stumble outside covered in blood and starts yelling at a startled neighbor to call the police and an ambulance. The authorities arrived at the scene not long after and found Jennifer shivering and looking panicked. The officer at the scene didn't see any external injuries on her, so he started suspecting that she was sexually assaulted. She gets sent to the hospital along with her father, and the officer accompanying both breaks the news that her mother is dead and asks if she can remember anything that happened. Jennifer had her story straight from the start. Three men robbed the house and killed her parents for being uncooperative. Simple as that. After a checkup at the hospital, Jennifer gets brought in for questioning. At this point, people believed that she was the victim in all this, so the detective questioning her, Randy Slade, was careful with his questions. He gently explains that he's not actually accusing her of anything and wants nothing but honesty from her. You're swearing to tell the truth about what you're going to talk to me about, and it's also going to explain to you the, um, the penalties for not telling the truth. She nods in understanding, but grows more uncomfortable when the detective starts listing the penalties if she gets caught lying. She can be seen fidgeting and rubbing her legs before placing her hand over her heart when Slade mentions that she can face up to 14 years in jail for lying. Slade leaves the room to get a Bible, and when he gets back, Jennifer easily gets startled and jumpy despite the anti-anxiety medication. Now I want you to sort of take yourself back to earlier on today. During the first part of the interview, she's calm, she only starts showing emotion when her mother gets mentioned. She bows her head and starts sobbing uncontrollably. For the other detectives, everything looked normal until Jennifer was given a tissue and it came away dry, meaning she hadn't cried a single tear. But this was chalked up to her being traumatized and shocked, and her body language up to this point wasn't enough to prove anything. Slade then went on to ask her about the intrusion. Jennifer starts describing the story she had made up before. Three men broke in and got extremely angry about the lack of things to steal and her parents being so uncooperative that they shot them both in the head. Jennifer says that one of the men is a black man with dreadlocks that quote unquote flopped to his face, making it impossible for her to make out his features. She also repeats the phrase, because I don't want to say the wrong thing, which raised a few eyebrows. Slade asked her to describe the events that led up to the crime twice. This was done in order to see if there are any inconsistencies in her story. Jennifer remained calm and collected during the retell, but sure enough, her story wasn't the same. The detectives especially took notice of her distressed, whiny tone when she described the final moments of her mother's life. And when Slade asks her that if anything strange happened that could have led up to the murder, Jennifer gave the standard answer. You live a straightforward, kind of almost routine life. She also grows nervous when she's told that her brother, Felix, is getting interviewed in the next room. She doesn't ask if he's okay after everything that happened or whether she could speak to him like a good sister would. Instead, Jennifer looks more concerned about the fact that he's interviewed in the first place. Slade also gives out a piece of information that stresses Jennifer out. They'll be going through texts and phone records. She flinches when she hears it and takes the information with her hands crossed to her chest. Don't be afraid of me. I'm just afraid because, you know, like, I know everything is just all pointing. 
Jennifer is more than shocked when she finds out the investigation will be going on and tries to take back her sense of control by asking if she'll be informed over who will get contacted. Slade leaves her in the dark and she leaves the station at 5 a.m. in the morning. Though the investigators remain neutral in these types of situations, Jennifer is still seen as a victim by Slade when she gets invited for the second interview. But the police pondered about some holes in the story, like the fact that the family's car was not taken by robbers, and that the robbers didn't use crowbars to break in, or zippers to tie the family members up. The biggest confusion was that her parents were killed and she was left unharmed for no reason. Plus, Daniel let it slip that she had a second cell phone. Jennifer gets called back in for a second interview, but now she seems more prepared. Slade has barely sat down before Jennifer tries to manipulate him by saying she's nervous in hopes that this will excuse any mistakes or inconsistencies in her stories. She even tries to appear nervous by stuttering a little and fiddling with her hands as if she's reassuring herself, but she can't look Slade in the eyes. But just to be sure that the detective understood just how nervous she is, she goes a bit overboard by explaining, Because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, so... Because that day was a lot. You're right. And I've been scattered, and so bits and pieces are here, and some pieces aren't here, and... When she says this, she looks at Slade for confirmation and looks relieved when he gives her the validation she has been asking for. She clearly wants Slade to tell her that it's okay if she makes mistakes, like he did in the first interview. And every time she prompts him, they respond, If you've told the truth and you've been truthful through this whole process, then you're helping. After which she starts fiddling with her hands again. Jennifer is asked to recall that day again, and that's where she understands that the police might be onto something. To start getting more inconsistencies out of her, Slade asks her to tell the story, but now in backwards chronological order. He assures her this is only an exercise to make her remember more, always making sure to convince Jennifer that he does not think her as a suspect. He also keeps telling her she's doing great after every pause, giving her the validation she needs. But Jennifer wasn't prepared for this, and this is where her story starts getting cracks. While she's telling the story, she keeps holding her stomach and fiddling with her hands as if the nervousness is eating her inside out. When Slade points out the other inconsistencies in her third retelling of the story, she starts sobbing and apologizing. The biggest tell that she was lying was exactly this, her constant apologies whenever he pointed out a change in the story since the last interview. Let's come back to now. You're being taken to the, the banister in the I'm upper sorry, I don't, don't apologize, okay? I'm going to try and ask you questions to try and clarify points, okay? If you don't remember, you don't remember. No. Okay, no, so just, just, then in this case, then don't apologize to me. It's okay, okay? I'm going to ask you questions to clarify points. Because okay. you know that it'll be very easy. It, it will be a very easy thing to discredit you on, right? We're, we're in the process of trying to add credibility to what you tell us, and that's through the process of asking people and doing whatever. Through that same process, it will be very easy to find the flaws in what you've said, which again then turns the focus back to you. Also, anytime she's called out, she'll stop talking and hold her face between her hands as if she don't recall, but she's trying to remember the story she made up. He tries to make her open up or maybe feel guilty by telling her, The only reason you would apologize to me is if you've lied to me. Slade also mentions the second phone and Jennifer feigns ignorance, saying that her friend Daniel had given it to her, but she had hidden it and didn't remember where. Then Slade asks her to demonstrate how she was able to call the police with her hands tied in hopes that the way in which she was tied and the way she was able to get the phone and make the call would contradict each other. In an attempt to make him feel guilty for making the request in the first place, Jennifer seems disgusted at the fact that Slade doesn't believe her and acts as if she has been violated by his request. But you can see her panic and the wheels turning in her head that she had just dug herself a hole she couldn't dig herself out of. However, by a stroke of luck or maybe because she had prepared herself for this, she passed his test successfully. Jennifer then tries to explain why she was the only one left alive at the crime scene, saying she was cooperating with the robbers. Slade keeps pressuring her more and more during the interview, and Jennifer's stress level increases. She fails to notice that her behavior is not under her control anymore as she starts shaking her leg uncomfortably, having long pauses between sentences and whispering to herself while she recounts the invasion. 
So we're just correcting what you said earlier because you said earlier that it was number two who was asking where the purse is, what are the purse is, and now you've said now it's number one guy who would I'm initially... Sorry. No, no, no. It's all a purpose. Uh, the purpose here is clarifying what you're saying. She seems to realize that the detective doesn't actually see her as the victim anymore and is starting to suspect something. We can see her confidence in her story flail by each pause between her words. Now she appears genuinely scared, but they've yet to see her be sad about what happened to her parents. She's only nervous of getting caught. The tone of the interview shifts when her past gets mentioned and Jennifer tries to get the detective to sympathize with her. She talks about the pressure her father inflicted on her, says that she lied about graduating high school because she didn't want to disappoint him and that she powered through the lies because of that. Slade gets surprised though when Jennifer asks him not to reveal any of this to her dad. With her mother dead and her being questioned by the police, the opinion of her father still means a lot to Jennifer. During the interview, it becomes obvious how Jennifer got away with so many lies for so long. She only lies when necessary. She only starts looking distressed when Slade leaves the room, pacing around until her obsessive movements morph and she begins stroking her ponytail. Her meltdown becomes even more obvious when she asks about how the investigation is going, but she fails to notice as she's too busy trying to keep herself from breaking down. Slade ends up changing the investigation method. Now he has turned accusatory. He has lured her into a false sense of security, has brought her defense down, and is attacking her with quick questions and expecting quick answers, not letting her think of an excuse or a story. When he asks Jennifer on a clarification on whether she was involved in the murder, she only shakes her head with her bottom lip quivering. No interaction, no belief, no, you didn't have anything to do with this thing at all, whatsoever. No. You don't engage in illegal activity? No. She stays loyal to her story, but then Slade implies something that she wasn't too happy with. She might have been involved because she held resentment towards her parents. Hearing this, Jennifer looks absolutely shocked and puts her hand on her chest. The interview ends in four hours. By November 12, Han got out of his coma, and despite his injuries, he remembered everything that happened the night of the robbery, including two bone-chilling details that gave the police just what they were looking for. He told them that Jennifer had chatted to one of the intruders like they were friends, and that she was being led around the house without her hands tied. That's what the authorities needed to bring Jennifer back for questioning a third time on November 2nd, but now, Jennifer isn't seen as the victim anymore, but as the main lead. Slade also isn't the one interviewing her, but instead, Detective Bill Getz does the job this time. Detective Getz is cold and calculating from the get-go and shows that he has no time for Jennifer's games. I know you did. But it got too far ahead of you, right? You didn't see, you didn't think this far ahead, did you? But once they started, once they came in, you couldn't stop it, could you? Could you? Jen? Hmm? I know. This is part of the read technique of interrogation, in which the investigator tries to convince the suspect that they already have all the evidence to prove that the suspect is guilty. Then, the demeanor of the investigator during the interrogation changes into them appearing understanding, patient, and non-demeaning. The whole point of the detectives who use the read technique is to make the suspect gradually more comfortable with telling the truth. But Jennifer keeps up her act nevertheless. She still keeps sobbing when her mother is brought up, but rather than consoling her, Getz tells her to speak up. Despite the fact that he was cold in the beginning, the detective tries to make her smile and Jennifer looks to be happy with the attention. It looks like she believes that she is getting away with her lies once again and that this interview is going to go just as well as the first two, that she will lie and victimize herself out of the situation. It seems like Getz knows this too, considering that she feels so secure in herself that she doesn't ask for a lawyer even in her third interview. She's also so confident that it hasn't occurred to her yet that she's the lead suspect in this murder case and still sees herself as the victim. Detective Getz comes to the conclusion that the only way to get any valuable information out of her is to empathize with her and make her feel like she had a reason to do what she did. This is the second step of the Reed technique, 
try to shift the blame away from the suspect to the circumstances that might have led them to commit the crime. Following the technique, he develops and presents the theme in a monologue and in a sympathetic manner to justify or excuse the crime. So he ends up shining a spotlight on her struggles while she was growing up and appears to be understanding of what she went through. He even justifies her constant lies in order to get Jennifer to open up with him, saying that he gets the reasoning behind it and that the stress and pressure would be too much for anyone. This ends up working perfectly with a suspect like Jennifer, who during her entire life has wanted someone to understand her struggles with her parents. She didn't have many friends. Daniel ended up leaving her once her parents made things too complicated, so she feels relieved that this stranger in front of her understands the pressure her parents put her through. So she ends up opening up. You need to tell me what went on because you know who was in that house that night. You, you do, Jen, there's no question about that, okay? Am I right? And finally, you had to bite back, right? And when he finally gained her trust, he suddenly turned the tables on her. He keeps putting pressure on her with questions about her story, telling her they have proof that she's involved. Finally, Jennifer cracks. You have to let me know what happened here. Okay? Okay. But you were involved. Right? That's the part we need. Okay? We need to hear that from you because we know you were. After barely saying anything for so long, she utters something that can barely be heard. She repeats it, this time loud enough for Getz and the audio system to pick up. You knew before that night that they were coming. Right? It's not worth it anymore. It's hurting you. Jennifer then turns to another story, saying that the plan was to kill her instead of her parents, but something went wrong and her parents ended up getting killed instead. After the police went through her calls and texts and conducted a series of interviews, they ended up arresting Jennifer, Daniel, Milvaganam, Cardi, and Crawford, and charged all of them with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. The trial began in March of 2014, and it took 10 months to complete. All of the suspects denied being guilty at court, but there was enough evidence to assume they all were involved. On December 13, 2014, Jennifer, Daniel, Cardi, Crawford, and Milvaganam were found guilty of first-degree murder and attempted murder. They received life sentences with no chance of parole and additional life sentences to be served concurrently. Right before the verdict was given, Jennifer appeared upbeat and playful in court. She also appears to be on friendly terms with the guards, maybe in order to look more empathetic to the judges and to the public. She exchanges small talk with them, smiling and acting pleasant. Jennifer managed to keep her face emotionless when she was sentenced. In fact, through the 10 months the trial took place, she appeared in court every day gracefully with clean clothes and walked into the court with her posture and sitting down slowly. But as soon as the press had left the room, Jennifer burst into tears and started shaking uncontrollably. Though she had tried to convince the court before that the reason she cried so much was because of her mother's death, one of the jurors is convinced that she's trying to play the victim one last time. The effect of her actions can be seen on her family years after her conviction. Han is unable to work and suffers anxiety attacks and nightmares. Felix, on the other hand, moved to the East Coast to escape being associated with his sister and suffers from depression and has been very closed off ever since. All that Jennifer wanted was to be free of the shackles placed on her by her parents, but her actions ended up causing far more pain to a greater multitude of people. Tell me your thoughts in the comments. Hope you enjoyed the video and see you next time.